Hello everyone, I'm Rishikesh Radhakrishnan. I'm a systems engineer with Cisco Systems and I'm part of the App Dynamics business unit. I bring about 15 plus years of experience in design, development, and support for complex systems in banking, financial systems, uh, in aerospace, and also in service provider. Currently, I'm focused on AIOps, APM, and Kubernetes, and my past roles have been with cloud automation, managing and orchestration, and IoT, and various of the use cases that can be offered as a service. This is the code exchange where you can look at the source code that I have. The URL is over here. You can choose to select, uh, use this source code to run it in your own Kubernetes clusters as well. In terms of the DevNet resources and the tools, my favorite environment are the sandbox. It gives you exposure to a wide variety of different Cisco tools and ecosystems. And my favorite sandboxes are the Cisco App Dynamics Sandbox, the IOX Sandbox, and the Cisco Container Platform Sandbox. Of course, as you start using the sandboxes, you'll see there's much more variety available that you can really use there. Now let's talk about the presentation today we have. We're talking about who moved evicted throttle my parts. To go there, let's talk about the evolution. We have the computing evolution that started with mainframes, went on to client server, to web, and finally cloud, microservices, and FaaS. Essentially, this is all in line to keep up with the business needs. Businesses have become agile. They want to release features and offers faster to the market and get user response quickly and understand whether they want to fine tune their approach or not. And technology is trying to adapt to that and be able to support those business needs. So it's no longer the case where you wait about seven to eight months to release your new features. You want to be able to release them sooner, faster, and get feedback faster. And that's where the current evolution with cloud microservices and its functions as a service helps you deliver that. Now to go ahead, let's look at the whole application architectures themselves. We had monoliths in the past. We had one or two machines which kind of had everything bundled in them, your user, user interface, your business layer, your persistence, storage, everything bundled in, in one or two or maybe three, four machines. But today you're going into a distributed or microservices approach. You can choose to be polyglot, essentially, which means that you don't have to define a technology stack which is consistent for the entire team. Depending on the problem that the team is trying to solve, where various uh, functions that they're trying to implement in the application, they can choose to use the right technology stack. So you can have one application that's, pol that's polyglot. You can power it using Java, Node.js. Uh, you could have uh, containerized workloads. You could have functions workload. You could, uh, you could essentially have RDBMS or NoSQL DBs. You could have a mix and match trying to use the right mix that's right for your business. And this brings its own challenges, right? You're suddenly looking at a chatty service. You're trying to look at distributed debugging. How do you solve these problems? Now, let's talk about the platform that really helps you to do that. So the Kubernetes platform brings you really beautiful abstractions which help you do this. It abstracts certain key fundamentals which allow you to deliver loosely coupled and highly cohesive kind of an architecture. So to go ahead, let's have a quick primer on the underlying, the different components of the abstractions that Kubernetes provides. Starting with the Kubernetes cluster itself, you have the different nodes in it, depending on the size of your cluster. Moving on, you have the node itself, which has the container runtime, which, can, which is Docker in this case, but can be different runtimes. Then you have the kubelet, which monitors the containers in your pod, and you also have the pod itself. The pod itself is the smallest unit of compute available in Kubernetes. The pods have their own IP address, they can have different volumes mounted on them, and this can be persistent or this can be temporary, depending on the kind of use case that you're looking. And the containers themselves are within the pod. So you can have multiple containers or you can have just one container, depending on how you choose to set it up. Finally, you have services which expose the application as a network service. So you have applications that are running in a pod, they are available as a network service. So you no longer have service discovery or load balancing explicitly that you need to configure for your application. If the services help you define that. And how do you tie your services to your pods? Is through labels. So you can have different services, different pods, and you can tie them all together using your labels. And finally, the deployment. This abstraction is what allows you to roll out your applications, be able to control what version you're rolling out, how soon you're rolling out, what is the frequency you're rolling out which, and gives you fine control over how your application is available for your end users. Let's talk about the pod resources. Some of the commonly specified pod resources are memory, CPU, and storage. We'll not be covering storage today. We'll be talking about memory and CPU. So give you a quick snippet. This is the snippet that's available in my example code. 
this is a part of my Kubernetes manifest for my particular pod. And specifically, I want to highlight the request and the limits. The request is what's used by the Kubernetes scheduler to decide the node on which the pod is to be placed. The limits are used by the kubelet to enforce limits on the resources consumed by the container. Now let's look at those specifically. How do memory and CPU operate? Memory is an incompressible resource, which means that it cannot be throttled. Right? So if you are running into issues like out of memory, your pods being killed, that's specifically because you have a memory problem there. And their limits and requests are measured in bytes. You essentially convert the limits into an integer value and set that as a memory limit. CPU is interesting because it's a compressible resource, which means that it can be throttled. And how do you measure them is in the CPU units. So one CPU unit is equal to one vCPU or one core in cloud provider perspective. From bare metal perspective, it's one hyperthread. One CPU unit is also computed as 1000 millicore or milli CPU. And how are they converted in terms of requests and limits? Requests, the value is converted into a core, which may end up as a fraction, and it's multiplied by 1024. Why 1024? Because one CPU has 1024 CPU shares. You multiply that core value into 1024, and that's what your container CPU shares are. So in this example, you have 600. You multiply that into your core value, that's 0.6, and multiply that further into your 1024, that's your CPU shares. So you get 614 CPU shares. Now limits. Limits are values converted into millicore and multiplied by 100. And the resultant is the total CPU time that's available for your container every 100 millisecond. So in this case, it's 800. 800 multiplied by 1,000 is 80,000. So that's 80 millisecond every 100 millisecond. So your CPU, so your container essentially gets 80 milliseconds every 100 milliseconds for the application to kind of execute on that. So what this means is that if you have a particular container needs more than that, you will not be getting those many CPU cycles. You will get it the next 100 milliseconds. Using the requests and the limits, we, come, we arrive at the QoS classes. The pods can then be categorized based on the QoS classes into three different types, and these are in decreasing order of priority. So you start with guaranteed, then you're burstable, and best effort. Guaranteed is when you define the limits and optionally the requests, and they are defined for all the resources across all the containers. And that's when you classify them as guaranteed. So in the example that you have here, you can see the first example is when you have two containers, that's foo and bar, and you have the limits defined for them. This is a guaranteed pod. Similarly, you have the other example there. You have two containers, you have the limits and the requests, and the values are the same. And this, for each container, the values are the same. And this is, again, a guaranteed pod. Similarly, for burstable, if you have the requests and optionally the limits, that's when you have it as burstable, the definition I kind of put out here. And if you do not specify the node, the limits, then it defaults to the node capacity. So the example is when you have the limits over here for the first example, where you have uh, the foo container has the kind of request resources defined, the limits and request requests, but the bar container does not have it. The second one is when you have the limits defined for that, and you have the request defined similarly for the last container. The worst QS is the best effort. If you do not have requests and limits set for any of the containers across the pod, in that case, you define you have a QS for that as best effort. And the example is pretty simple. You just have two containers and you have no resources defined for that, no resource limits or requests defined for that. Now, how does it kind of play into what happens to your pod? So when you talk about who evicted, killed, or throttled your pods, the QoS plays a good amount of a role over there. So typically, if your pods are evicted, you may want to look at whether your cluster is experiencing memory or disk pressure. If it's not able to schedule resources, then the pods are evicted in order of best effort, burstable, and then guaranteed. Moving on to killed. Your pods are typically killed, again, when, you are, when your cluster is experiencing memory or disk pressure. And this depends on the memory limits. Also, containers where you have not defined any memory limits have the greatest chance of being killed. And the pods are, again, killed in order of best effort, burstable, and guaranteed. And there's a caveat here. The burstable and guaranteed are typically not evicted or killed. However, if the system itself is experiencing constraints, uh, resource constraints, or your system demons which need more resources than that's been uh, kind of reserved for them, in such a scenario, your resources, your pods will still be evicted in order of resource usage, whether they are burstable or guaranteed. And finally, the CPU throttling part. 
Now, what happens is with respect to CPU is the only resource which is kind of throttled. So you don't see your pods being killed. You don't see your pods being evicted. Throttling is very specific for the CPU metrics that you define, the CPU limits and the requests, right? The pods do not get evicted or killed because of this, but it does affect your overall application performance. Now, we've spoken about all of this. What is the impact? Every time your pod gets throttled, evicted, or killed, you are looking at a poor application performance and which directly impacts your user experience and also impacts your revenue the revenue that your potentially your business application could generate. What that means is, for example, every time a pod is undergoing a throttling or an eviction or being killed, you're not servicing the particular request there. Your pod could have been servicing a user request. So maybe somebody's trying to check out, maybe somebody's trying to renew the subscription. That particular action gets affected and that contributes to poor user experience, which contributes potentially to potential revenue impact because that user may abandon your application at that point of time. So this is something really important to understand that even though we understand how this may uh, be behaving, what is the impact of that to your application? Which brings me to the part where it's really important to monitor your Kubernetes applications to understand what's happening to them. And how we can do that is I would like to introduce the AppDynamics cluster region, which essentially is how you can monitor your AppDynamics, uh, your uh, Kubernetes cluster using our cluster region. Now this works in all Kubernetes distributions, whether it's do it yourselves, EKS, EKS Fargate, uh, OpenShift, Rancher, Cisco Container Platform, pretty much all the ones over there. And some of the important use cases that we look at are application migration, uh, faster MTTI, issue triaging, being able to proactively monitor missing dependencies, uh, mapping the application performance on Kubernetes cluster to your business outcome. What I spoke about before in terms of what is the impact, how we measure that. Some of the unique features that we give is real-time visibility into a Kubernetes cluster being able to triage uh, your metrics for easy investigation further. How do you correlate your cluster metrics with the application performance and the different runtimes that we support? And the deployment is extremely simple. We bundle it as a Kubernetes operator. So it's about three to four steps using which you can deploy cluster region on your Kubernetes cluster. And the right side is a kind of a snapshot of how it looks, shows you a quick summary of your overall cluster there. Now moving on to the demo, we'll quickly show you how the cluster region shows up once you deploy there. This is the landing page for the AppDynamics controller. Once you land in, this gives you the one portal, one UI to look at your application landscape. From here, let's click on the servers, which takes you to the cluster that's being monitored. From servers, click on the clusters, and you can select the cluster that you're interested in that's already been instrumented in my case. Click on it, and then click on details. Once you're here, you get a dashboard, a kind of a quick view of your overall cluster. Starting with the errors, errors first here, Let's go and click on the errors. And when you click here, it takes you to the events tab and lists you the events that have occurred in your cluster. So you can click on one of them and click on the details. It gives you a summary view of the event that has happened so far. So you have the severity type, the cluster type, and a summary of that particular event. So it gives you a quick view of what happened in that particular event. From here, let's click on the dashboard. And you can see it gives you details about how many pods have been evicted, if there are any threats, on your particular cluster for your pods. And then also shows you the pods running by phase. So for that's fail, whether it's running, or whether it's kind of uh, remote. And if you go to the particular representation here, this shows you the state of your pods that's uh, for over the past one hour. So whether it's restarted, whether it's pending, and that particular time period can be controlled. Then moving on to the right side, you see the cluster capacity indicated there. And Moving on below, you see the pod issues. So whether your pods have been experiencing restarts, errors, or the time period we configured before, you, you can see that over here. And subsequently, moving on to the image. If you are experiencing image pool errors and issues with that, and any storage quota violations or errors. Going down, you see the utilization per cluster, the CPU and the memory and the persistent volume claims. And at the bottom most part, you see the quotas. In this cluster, we haven't defined any quotas, so you don't see any details here. Now let's go to the inventory tab. The inventory, you can see the name of the cluster, the Kubernetes version, the number of pods, and the namespaces that we have. Now you'll see that this says the masters are zero because this is a managed Kubernetes cluster, it's EKS. So we don't have access because of which you see zero here. However, there are seven workers and we uh, instrumented them, so you see them there. And there are, there's no disk or memory pressure, which kind of indicates it over there. And also the phases for your pods. 
you can see how many are running, succeeded or pending. In terms of metrics, you can see this particular highlighted over here. If you double click on that, you see the number of pods that have been defined with no limits. Again, the time period is configurable, but that's what it is selected for now. This also shows you the namespaces for your application. At the moment, we have all the namespaces, but you can configure and control what you want to see there. On the right side are the Kubernetes objects. We can quickly look at the jobs that are running, double click that and you see the metrics and shows you the jobs and the status for the jobs over the time period that you define. And finally, at the bottom, you have the services exposed in your application, in your, in your Kubernetes cluster. From here, let's go to the pods part. Over pods, you get a quick representation on top in terms of the status for the pods, whether they're succeeded, whether they're running or they're failed, and you can click them to filter the pods that are listed below. So you click on succeeded, shows you the pods that are succeeded, and similarly for the other statuses that you have. Now, I'm interested in a specific pod that I want to showcase. So let me go and search for that. So rewards is the name of my pod. And this shows up here. And when I click on this and click on details, it shows me the, uh, the details of my pod in terms of my pod name, the namespace that the pod is kind of running in, and the CPU and the memory utilization. And if there are any tags associated with the pods, it also shows them in the bottom pane there. Now, what's interesting is the APM correlation. This is something that's unique to us. Right? So when you click on that, it takes you to the application flow map. This shows you how your node is interacting with the other services in your application. This simple guestbook application, so it's interacting with another service. It also shows you the overall load, the response time, and the errors being experienced by your application. You can also compare it with the baseline. So that shows you how well it's performing, whether it's better than the baseline or it's worse. And this is a dynamic baseline. You don't need to configure it. App Dynamics uh, does dynamic baselining. So it adapts to your application performance, uh, application metrics uh, based on the time or the event of the day. Now, this is how your application is in isolation with your pod and the service. But when you want to look at the overall application, this is how it looks. These are all the components that are kind of interacting with the different services and how it looks in terms of the various services you're consuming, the load, the average response time, all also compared with the baseline. Now, this is how the application is running. You're getting the metrics and you're able to correlate with the underlying cluster that's powering your application. So this becomes one place where you can look at your cluster, look at the cluster metrics, and also correlate it back with your application metrics. So thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed the session. Have a great day.